Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Nazia Iqbal and here's a look at the stories for the day. We now get food and groceries delivered within 15 minutes of ordering them on mobile apps. But have you wondered what it takes to accomplish such a feat? What the delivery executive goes through in between picking the order from the restaurant or warehouse and handing it over to you? One of them, Salil Tripathi, lost his life 8 days ago on a cold winter night while his wife and a minor son waited for him back home. Salil was the sole breadwinner of his family and so are lakhs of others who continue to walk a tight rope without any insurance and other social security benefits which workers in organized sectors enjoy. When Salil's accidental death attracted the media glare, Zomato CEO Dipinder Goyal took to Twitter and assured help in processing an insurance payout of rupees 10 lakh. Zomato employees contributed rupees 12 lakh to the family and a fundraising page started by his wife raised about rupees 9 lakh. While Zomato's move came as a welcome step, this instance has emphasized the need to provide social security benefits to gig and platform workers. Gig workers currently depend on the generosity of companies. In the absence of a legislation that grants protections to gig workers, the companies employing them don't have a uniform policy on the kind of insurance cover they should provide to their drivers or delivery partners in case of accidents or medical emergencies. Zomato covers its delivery partners with accident and life insurance along with an OPD allowance whereas Swiggy offers rupees 6 lakh worth of medical and accident insurance cover however Shaikh Salauddin the national general secretary of the Indian Federation of App Based Transport Workers told Business Standard that there have been several instances where Zomato and Swiggy haven't done enough to compensate their delivery partners for loss of pay after they met with an accident while on the job The IFAT represents gig workers employed by food delivery and taxi apps. The recent Fair Work India report 2021 ranked Indian startups based on how they treat their gig workers. It said that most Indian startups don't score well when judged against the principle of fair conditions. To address this issue and many more, the central government has come up with the Code on Social Security which recognizes gig workers and platform workers. But according to reports The center is unlikely to implement it before state elections in Uttar Pradesh and Punjab this year as it is worried about the possibility of protests by labor unions after having had a similar experience with the three contentious farm laws that had to be withdrawn. The Supreme Court too has admitted a petition by the IFAT that seeks classification of gig and platform workers as unorganized workers under the Unorganized Workers Act 2008. This would entitle them to benefits such as provident fund health and maternity benefits and old age protection the ifat's petition points out that recently two large cab aggregators updated their service agreements for their riders and drivers to essentially absolve the ride sharing or hailing company of all liabilities and or responsibilities towards the drivers or riders one of the aggregators for instance has stopped using the word partner in the agreement and now defines individuals utilizing its app service for commercial gains as customers Gayatri Singh, co-founder of Human Rights Law Network and the advocate who filed the PIL on behalf of IFAT, explained why the present working arrangements between gig workers and platforms is untenable. Our problem with the social security code is that though this is the code which actually for the first time defines what who gig workers and platform workers are. Right. Uh it ha- it is meaningless. If you read the social security code what are the benefits that these workers are getting so so we have expanded it to say that even otherwise the government policy is to include gig workers and platform workers as unorganized workers as defined under the social security code so so even though though the social security code is not in force yet this the they uh, everybody rec- recognizes the fact that they are unorganized workers not workers and if if that is the case then the social security code should have provided for very clear cut uh, benefits so basic like like a, 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 a social security flaw what is the basic minimum which workers should get but there is no such 
uh, provision in the Social Security Code. Except for defining what Social Security is, it merely defines it, that this is what it is, old age compensation, unemployment compensation, sickness, maternity benefit, work injury, etc. That is defined. But uh, but how are you going to implement it? What is the flaw on which, what is the basis on which you will arrive at, say, old age compensation or unemployment compensation? Mm-hmm. Basic flaw. Uh, so uh, uh, that is not there. The new code on social security introduced by the government also envisages a social security fund for gig workers, which will collect contributions from aggregators. Introduction of the code will address many issues plaguing the gig economy in India now. It mandates compulsory registration of both gig and platform workers on an online portal to avail these benefits. Because of a continuous fall in wages and a rise in out-of-pocket expenses, these delivery gigs, originally supposed to be part-time work for pocket money, have now become the mainstay for many. According to several testimonies in the Fair Work report, most delivery partners spend 12 to 16 hours daily to make ends meet. And the gig economy is here to stay. A report by Boston Consulting Group says that India's gig economy has the potential to serve up to 90 million jobs in the next 8 to 10 years from about 24 million today. Labor codes are indeed a big step in the right direction. But clearly, the road to social security for gig and platform workers is long and bumpy. Amid the ongoing uncertainty, Business Standards Bhashwar Kumar spoke to Dr. K. Srinath Reddy, President of Public Health Foundation of India, to know his views about how the third wave is likely to play out and whether it will be different from the previous disastrous waves that India had witnessed. Dr. Reddy, welcome to the show. As we continue to grapple with the third wave, let us begin by asking, when will India witness a peak in the number of Omicron COVID-19 cases and what will be the duration of this wave? I believe when the peak will occur, how high the peak will be and how fast it will subside is dependent upon two factors. One is the transmissibility of the virus, which in the case of Omicron, we know to be very high. It spreads very fast. The second factor is how open are we ourselves to getting infected? If we wear masks, avoid crowded events, and move in well-ventilated places, we will not permit the virus an opportunity to enter our bodies. And therefore, if we follow those, then we can delay the peak we can sort of flatten the wave a bit and prolong the overall course of this particular wave and thereby give our health system and social systems a greater opportunity to cope with it rather than let it surge skyward within a short space of two or three weeks. Uh, Therefore, if we are careless, we are likely to see the wave peaking by end of January. On the other hand, if we manage to slow down the transmission, by getting as many people to wear masks for as long a period as possible outside of the home and in avoiding crowded events, which are super spreader events, then we can actually stretch out the epidemic and make the peak happen in February and have the pandemic wave subside by March possibly. Experts in India say that the country has hybrid immunity due to which Omicron will be less effective. Has this been the case so far? Well, we know for a fact that whatever immunity is there, whether it is because of previous infection or because of vaccines or because of a combination of both, does not fully protect against infection per se. It protects against severe illness, hospitalization and death. Therefore, if you are counting the wave in terms of Infections, no, the hybrid immunity is not going to protect you against infections. Masks will. But the hybrid immunity is likely to reduce the number of people who are severely ill. What sort of estimates do we have on the number of cases we'll see at the peak? And how will that compare with the number seen in the Delta wave? Also, what about the peak in hospital admissions 
and deaths when compared to the delta wave i believe that as far as the infections are concerned if you are counting the number of people who are diagnosed to have covid by way of testing or by way of clear cut symptoms then you are going to see much larger numbers than during the delta wave because omicron is highly transmissible and it will infect a large number of people irrespective of whether they were vaccinated but if we are counting it in terms of the number of people requiring severe uh, illness related hospitalization and intensive care then i believe the numbers will be lower but it's also true that if we allow a very large number of people to get infected then we are likely to see some pressure on the hospitals as well but the number of deaths are likely to be lower certainly one of the distinguishing features between the first and the second waves which we need to take into account for the third wave is the spread into smaller towns and rural areas from the large metros where the wave started in the first wave partly because of the lockdown and mostly because of the post lockdown restrictions we prevented much of the rural areas and many of the small towns from getting infected and that's why the wave subsided but during the second wave we did not observe any of the precautions because of unrestricted travel local body elections assembly elections religious gatherings this time too we should ensure that we slow down the transmission from the large urban centers to the smaller towns and villages so that the peak cannot really happen as a huge uncontrolled surge but can be spread out over several weeks clearly the actions of the authorities along with the behavior of the public at large over the coming two weeks will determine the trajectory of the third wave after the pandemic and the havoc it has caused let us move on to markets After a long bout of selling, foreign portfolio investors are back on the Lal Street. Moreover, India remains among the top five emerging market economies that have seen renewed FPI interest. While some see this as bargain buying, others believe sustenance of these inflows holds the key for a firm market rally. Snapping their three-month selling spree, foreign portfolio investors or FPIs have turned net buyers of Indian equities so far in January 2022. As of January 13, our foreign counterparts were net buyers of Indian securities worth $479 million, including equities worth $434 million. With this, India remains among the top five emerging markets where FPIs have invested this year. Data provided by Bloomberg shows that India was among the two countries that saw net FPI outflows for three consecutive months ending December 2021. While outflows from Indian equities totaled a massive $4,769 million during this period, net outflows from South Africa were $3,536 million. For the full calendar year of 2021, foreign portfolio investors pumped in 50,089 crore rupees in India. Their investment, however, is much less compared to the net inflows of 1.03 trillion in 2020 and 1.35 trillion in 2019 these street experts point that discomfort with valuations concerns about the monetary policy support and the rampant spread of the omicron variant of coronavirus led to aggressive selling besides record high levels touched by the benchmarks in mid october also gave fpis a good reason to book out let's go to ur bhat co-founder and director at alfanity fintech to know more so if you see the calendar year 2021 um if i net sell was 24500 crores and ipo if i ipo and was at particular is 80320 so it is largely because of ipo participation that it looks like as if it was a good year but not at all in the secondary market they have been reasonably big sellers they, they seem to be interested in participating in um, the new age um, sort of issues which have been uh, dominant in the uh, ipo market Uh, over the last one year, so uh, they are basically changing the strategy from probably old economy stocks they are selling a bit and creating a balance between old and new economy by participating in the new economy, new economy IPOs. 
but if you see the secondary market they have not been big buyers even in january they are marginal buyers uh, but december they have um, quite a few of the months in the last year secondary market they have been uh, reasonably consistent sellers so i think this is uh, the sort of surmise that they really are bigger investors in ipos and uh, new age uh, um, uh, sectors rather than the old age one As pointed out by Bhart, FBIs have begun buying cheap in the Indian markets, although secondary market buying remains marginal. That apart, the net buying at the beginning of the year is a relative play, believe analysts, as India seems to be managing the Omicron variant rather well. Moreover, the Purchasing Managers Index and the Goods and Services Tax numbers are an indication that the Indian economy is still in the recovery mode, despite the onslaught of the new variant. Hence if India is able to manage its fiscal and forex situation well India would stand tall among EM peers despite the rate hikes in developing economies given this Gaurav Dua head capital market strategy at Sher Khan by BNP Paribas believes FII interest will remain intact for India as the country is on an upcycle in the long term <coughs> FII inflows depend on the uh, strength of the economy and other macro indicators In the short term the FII inflows can be extremely unpredictable emerging markets on a, in a global uh, context are uh, you know relatively higher risk so uh, that is why at times uh, after a bout of uh, profit booking from FIIs you see a couple of days where they uh, where you see some buying interest uh, what we believe in this year uh, 2022 despite the fact that there is going to be normalization of the monetary uh, policy across the world which can lead to some strengthening in the uh, usd against other, other uh, 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 developed market uh, currencies uh, but still uh, we believe that uh, valuation and the evaluations in india are uh, attractive now and also india is uh, probably on a multi year upcycle and i think uh, this will keep the uh, the fii interest uh, basically intact in india experts expect india to be a relative outperformer than other emerging markets the union budget and the corporate commentary during the results season they say will also guide fpi's outlook on india from an investment view point em investors can look at those plays which are set to benefit from high interest rates matthew rashater head of equity strategy research at julia bear for instance says while we are not worried about the absolute levels of real interest rates at this stage it is much more about the speed of change in rate levels as such it is critical to apply a barbell strategy at this stage incorporating structural winners with stocks that benefit from higher yields and inflation such as financials that said while fii fpi activity will be one of the key factors determining the market trajectory over the long term the immediate trends will be set by q3 results and the union budget ultratech cement bajaj twins hol and reliance industries are among the prominent companies set to report their earnings this week overall the nifty 50 is expected to move in the range of 17650 and 18500 while the sensex may quote between 60400 and 62050 just like the companies the government too needs money so what does it do when it requires funds to meet its current obligation in excess of its annual revenue generation well it issues treasury bills or t bills our next report tells us more about it the reserve bank of india had last month auctioned three treasury bills at higher cutoff yields dropping some hints on the hardening of short term interest rates the government raised 10000 crores through this auction but how does it work let us see treasury bills are short term borrowing tools for the government they are promissory notes with guaranteed repayment at a later date they have a maximum tenure of 364 days issued in three maturities 91 days, 182 days and 364 days. Treasury bills are issued at a discount to the original value and the buyer gets the original value upon maturity. Let us explain it through an example. Say the government will sell rupees 100 T bill at a discounted price of rupees 95 in the money market. But after the maturity of say 91 days, it will buy back the T bill at its original price of rupees 100. 
So the buyer who bought the tea bill for rupees ninety five stands to make a profit of rupees five when the government buys back the tea bill. Tea bills don't generate any interest and are zero coupon securities. They are a safe investment instrument as they are a liability to the government. They are backed by the highest authority in the country and have to be paid back even in times of a financial crisis. But long-term treasury bonds have often been criticized for their low returns while slamming the low yield in this country. Famous US investor and fund manager William Gross had last year termed it as an investment garbage and he had also questioned if the stock markets will follow suit. Short-term capital gains realized through T-bills are subject to the STCG tax at rates applicable as per the income tax slab of the investor. However, retail investors aren't required to pay TDS upon redemption of T-bills. Zero risk weightage associated with treasury bills makes them an attractive instrument. Well, that is all we have for you today. We will be back with more news and analysis in our next episode. Stay tuned. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.